A question that I fairly often see down in the comments is how am I able to get these crisp and sharp videos with the Sony a6300 or the Sony a6400 a6 that I'm filming on right now? It looks pretty good, right? Basically just to know the Sony Alpha cameras. And to be honest with you, I'm not totally sure what I do differently from other people, but I thought that in this video I'll break down my entire process from, you know, my camera settings and picture profiles to the post process where I do the color grading and then what I think is probably one of the most important factors, the export settings. Yo, 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 Karla Freta, my name is Arnolur. I, I had to put that in for you guys. All right, so the first important thing that I want you to understand when you want to get crisp videos is that you want to nail as much as you can in camera. Because once you get in the editing, you don't want to do a lot of retrieving, more enhancing, if you know what I'm saying. So basically, you want your focus to be on, because if your focus is off, it's not going to look good, and white balance be on, and etc, etc. Now, I film as much as I can in 4K, and I think that the 4K on the Sony Alpha cameras is pretty good. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember correctly, it's actually 6K footage and it's then down sample to 4K and I think it looks very, very, very good. So as much as I can, I film in it. Now, if I'm doing slow motion, because we all know that these cameras cannot do 4K in slow motion, I basically upscale it. I made a vlog on it. I'll link it up here. I think it works and it looks actually pretty good, but maybe not upscale a whole video. That would be a little bit silly. But if you add it in with the four clips, it looks fantastic. Take a look for yourself. Now in 4K, I film in 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. I know that I'm based in a PAL country, but I really like that 30 frames a second. I want to have that option because I personally love to film a lot in 30 frames and then you can slow it down to 80%, which you cannot, there is no option for that in if you choose PAL, then you're basically just stuck with 25 frames per second. But I know that I'll introduce a little bit of flickering in the light that has to do with the electricity and whatnot, but I'm willing to take that for that 30 frames per second. Which brings us on to the next factor, which is that with the shutter speed, if I'm not doing something that requires some like artistic or creative expression, I use the 180 rule, which is basically just to double the amount of shutter speed based on what frame rates you're shooting in. So if it's 24, you shoot in shutter speed around 50 or 48 if you can. And if I'm shooting in 30 frames per second, I have shutter speed on 60, 160. This ensures that the motion blur is the most natural. You can Google this and read all you like about it. It's uh, highly scientific. I don't know if it's scientific, but this is the 180 rule. Now the ISO I try to keep as low as possible. The higher the ISO, the more noise you are gonna like get, which ruins the crispiness. But you know, I'm not super religious about it. If I'm filming in darker conditions, I bump it up for the sake of the shot. But here in the studio, I'm filming in ISO 200 right now. This is the lowest I can go in my picture profile. We get in this picture profile in a second. And that's basically because I'm in a controlled environment and I want to have it as low as possible. Now, a fun thing I can add that in a run and gun situation when I'm filming, I often have the ISO on auto. I cap it at around 1,600 or 3,200. I think that is like the maximum amount that I can use with these cameras. Like, of course I can go higher, but that's gonna introduce a lot of noise. And I think that above 1600, it's, I mean, it's okay, but I try to keep it below 800 if I want to have those crisp, crisp shots. But then again, I, I mean, I'm not too religious about it, okay? Now for the focus, it really goes without saying, but I want to nail my focus as much as I can. Because if your shot is like not in focus, it's not gonna look as crisp. That's just how it is. Now in a controlled environment like I'm in right now, I have manual focus on, because I know I'm just gonna be right here, and then it's not introducing any autofocus flickering. But in those run and gun situations, I do use autofocus. I think the autofocus on these cameras is fantastic, and I really like to use it. It saves a whole lot of time, and you don't have to be like, nailing the focus the entire time, which is super nice. And I have my autofocus set to continuous autofocus. <laughs> There's a lot of autofocus. The focus area is set to zone. I like to have the zone and move it around. The autofocus drive speed I set to fast. I sometimes have it to normal. I think that makes a little bit smoother, but I like it also at fast where it just snaps on. I think that looks nice to me. And the AF track sensor I have set to responsive. When you have beard, you do this often and it makes you feel wiser. You go like, hmm. If I'm in a situation and I don't really know what to do, I just do this. Hmm. And I instantly feel wiser. All right, so enough of that nonsense. No, me, my, me, me picture profile. My picture profile plays a somewhat role in the like crispiness and sharpness that I'm able to produce with these small cameras. And here it is. Black level I have set to plus four. 
the Gamma I have set to Cine 4. This is a picture profile that I've used for four years now, like a long time. I really much like this picture profile. However, since I got this on ASUS 400, it has Hey LG, HLG, and Iceland again say How at Gear 2 and 3, and I've been experimenting with those and I really much like them. But the Cine 4 is like my native profile and that's like what I'm most used to and that's the profile that you guys have been seeing me like on, I, th I don't think I've even posted the HLG video yet. So all that ramble was me trying to say that I use Cine 4. In Black Gamma, I have the range set to middle and level to zero. The knee I set to manual and there in the point, I have it on 90% and this slope I have on zero. Now the knee is basically the highlight roll off, how they roll off. And I see a lot of people that are like showing their picture profile, they have knee set to 85. I am so white that I think that my skin becomes a little bit like plastic if I have it like that. So I have it set to 90 and think that is nice. And then the slope is like how steep the curve is where it starts to meet. I have experimented a little bit with this and I find that zero works nice for me, but you can like experiment a little bit with it and see what works for you. This is what works for me, okay? Color mode, I use Eskamo 3 Cine. Now this is a pretty big color space and can be a little bit hard to color grade. So if you wanna use exactly my settings and you find it a little bit hard, you can switch the color mode to Cinema and you can have a little bit easier time color grading. Saturation, I have plus five. Color face, plus one. Color depth, I have like zero and everything. This is basically the luminance of each color. And I like to do this in post-production in the color grade. And then the details, I have set them to minus four. I think that the like in-body sharpening in these cameras is not like the greatest. It's produced a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit digital feeling. So I set it to minus four and then I'd rather add in you know, the sharpness in post-production. All right, so this is everything that I do in camera. Next is the uh, post processing, post video processing. So color grading definitely plays a huge role in my video production and you who follow me, you know that I really much like to color grade. Now, a few months back, I made a whole video breaking down my entire like process of color grading these videos. I'll link it up here. It's more detailed than I'm gonna do right now, but it has changed a little bit. So I'm gonna go over it a little bit, you know, a little bit more quickly, but if you're new to this and you really want to like understand it more, like more, I encourage you to watch that video. Now, I always start with the basic correction. Here I'm checking if the white balance was off and I might fix that a little bit, adding a little bit of contrast and then basically just fixing the exposure. Maybe the video was slightly underexposed or slightly overexposed and I'm basically just like fixing everything so it looks nice before I start to color grade it. After that, I head down to the creative tab and here I add my LUTs. They're definitely not mandatory if you want to have sharp and crisp like video footage, but they do help me get the specific look that I like and speed up my work process. A lot. Once I put one that I like, I will usually dial it down a little bit. Then I go down to the vibrance and saturation. Here I check a little bit how saturated I want the image to be. And then in the sharpening slider, here is where I add in a little bit of the sharpness back to it. And I think this is very good. Now here, you just have to experiment. I usually keep it from five to 15, somewhere around that. I've noticed if I go too high, the image starts to get very digital and not so nice. I don't like that. <laughs> Why am I hold I'm holding this camera like it's a prop here? <laughs> Oh, it's it maybe adds to the you know uh, theater that I'm creating here. Then once I'm done with the creative tab, I go down to the tonkers, and here's actually a place where I think I'm able to get a lot of that crispness and sharpness that you guys like in my videos. Now sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I basically do a basic S curve, but if I'm not. I actually do this special type of curve where I add notes all over the place and then I massage each point. I talked about this in the color grading video so you can like look it up. I don't know if we're gonna like put it again there, but it's, you can click and you know, you know how this works, right? But basically what I'm doing, I'm just, you know, massaging each spot on the tone curve and checking where it breaks. So I'm taking as far as I can before I see the image starting to break. And this creates a very nice balanced contrast that is exactly correct for the image that I'm working right now. And this is different on each video clip, so it takes a whole lot of time. But if I do this, I really get the shadows to be super, super nice, exactly where before they start to break and the highlights and mids are super nice. So this, this is actually, this is, this is the bomb, I think, I don't know. <laughs> this is just one chain, it's the whole chain that I'm like sharing with you right now. Now, another little trick I do here in the tonkers is to go down here to Luma and Set and I drag the ends both down like this. This basically ensures that there is no color in the whitest of white and the blackest of black. Those two colors stay true white and true black, which I think is, that makes a huge difference. Now, after the tonkers, I might go to the color wheels, but that is really nothing to do with the crispness and sharpness. 
so that I can wait for another video. Because now, the what I think is probably the most important thing, I'm, I'm gonna put down this camera, it's gonna be here. <laughs> it doesn't have to be in my hand. But that is the export settings that I use for YouTube, and I do believe that these settings is a big reason for the sharpness and crispness of my YouTube videos. Now, I've also made a whole video on that, and there I've probably, you know, broke it down in more details, I'll link it up here, but if you don't want to jump, I'll like cover it here, of course. So, in the format H264, and then, in the preset, I go to YouTube 4K. Once that is done, I go down here and I click match source just to make sure that it matches the source of the video that I'm editing. Now, I used to often check this box like render at maximum depth, but I, I watched some random YouTube video where a guy was like showing that his footage looked a little bit worse. So I tried it. I'm not really sure, but I don't want to take the chance. So nowadays, I don't click it. But again, I encourage you to experiment. Always experiment for yourself and see what works for you. This is just, you know, what works for me. Then I scroll all the way down and here is a very important part, the bitrate. Now I choose VBR, this is variable bitrate, and I always render it through two passes. This basically renders it two times, ensuring maximum amount of quality. Now basically, the higher the bitrate you have, the more quality you're going to get and the crisper your shots are gonna be. But you cannot go, you know, higher than your camera shoots in, because then you're just adding a bunch of bitrate that aren't there really and it's gonna, you're gonna get weird artifacts. But then again, YouTube is gonna press your videos a whole lot. So the settings that I've used like for the past year, and it's something that you've liked a whole lot because you've commenting about it, is this. I have VBR set to 80 and then I have the VBR2 set to 96. So it's 20% higher. And this basically just ensures a high quality export. And the last thing is to check this use maximum render quality. Click that and then just click export. Boom. All right, so this is my entire work process from the in-body camera, in-body camera. All right, so this is my entire work and thought process on getting the most like crispness on my videos from, you know, the in-body camera thingies to the post-production. Now, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to ask in comments down below. If you have any like better way of doing this, please let me know in the comments down below. I love to learn from you guys. Also, smack that like button for me. It really helped me out. Consider subscribing. I create lots of, lots of, lots of videos and I'll catch you guys in the next video mode. Peace.